Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, this afternoon's uh, Democracy Seminar. And I'm very pleased today to uh, introduce Matt Lira and Macon Phillips, which I will do in a moment. Um, but uh, as you know, today's Democracy Seminar is about the issue of uh, digital technologies and their potential for improving uh, democracy, and in particular, democratic engagement and the involvement of ordinary citizens in politics. And um, this is uh, a particularly interesting uh, afternoon discussion that we have because uh, usually, you know, it's the Kennedy School, so most of our speakers uh, come from a little bit to the left of the political spectrum, but today uh, we have a much better lineup that uh, we have uh, people from both sides here. And so Matt Lira is currently the Deputy Executive Director of the National um, Republican Senatorial Committee. In his earlier life, he worked as a grassroots organizer and co-funded a successful tech startup that developed websites for professional baseball players. Yeah. So it's kind of <laughs> in the Nate Silver sports politics. Yeah, not quite Nate Silver. <laughs> <laughs> thread of things. Um, he worked for years for Eric Cantor, including as senior advisor and director of new media, and among many efforts there to modernize the policy making process, uh, Matt developed a program to recruit uh, younger public servants, organized the first U.S. House of Representatives hackathon, or launched UCUT, a crowdsourcing platform for the public to nominate uh, federal uh, government spending cuts, convince Congress to place legislation online for three days prior to voting. I don't know why any congressman would actually want to do that, but <laughs> somehow he managed to do that. And organize frequent trips to Silicon Valley for the Republican leadership to try to get people up to date a little bit more on technology and industry uh, in the tech sector. Matt has also served as digital director for vice presidential nominee Paul Ryan. Uh, Matt strongly believes and advocates for the potential of digital platforms to uh, help out with our democratic processes. And the seminar series is all about how are those democratic processes need some help. Uh, he seeks to empower people through technology in having a greater voice in our nation's politics and governance. Uh, one of Matt's quotes is, so much of social media is nonpartisan. It can make government better. It's not make-believe. The key is to make sure that people's votes online have an effect on the outcome and that they're making an authentic impact on the process. Um, so uh, Matt is, uh, is a longtime advocate and a very skilled practitioner of digital politics. Macon Phillips is currently the coordinator for the Bureau of International Information Programs at the United States State Department. Uh, where he's been since September 2013. Uh, before that, way before that, he grew up in Alabama and went to college at Duke University, but Macon moved north to New England to, in 2003 when he joined AmeriCorps as a VISTA. As a Vista. Um, he, said that, he said that this community organizing experience is when he developed his interest in politics. Later on, he joined the storied company Blue State Digital, which was founded by alumni of the 2004 Dean Campaign, as many of you know. He worked with clients like the Democratic National Committee and Senator Ted Kennedy, the late Senator Ted Kennedy, Blue State, and uh, helped develop Blue State Digital and the Obama campaign's website. In the 2008 Obama campaign was impressed with Macon and hired him as deputy director of the campaign's new media department, which ran BarackObama.com. After the election, Macon was the head of new media for the transition, running change.gov. Um, the quote, uh, one, one thing Megan said is that I was out in Grant Park the night Obama won the election and had celebratory beers later that night and went straight to the office at 8.30 a.m. to turn on <laughs> change.gov. <laughs> then he joined the Obama administration as special assistant to the president and director of digital strategy. In this role, Megan managed White House, the, the at White House Twitter dot, uh, account. A lot of us would like to have that password, I guess. <laughs> uh, he uh, helped reimagine how the president and his administration commu could communicate directly with the American people and implement that vision through uh, uh, platforms like Google+, Reddit, and YouTube, responsible for um, the president's appearances on those platforms. I think you, you probably left before the Between Two Ferns appearance. Just before, Just before that. Uh, Phillips also launched the We the People 
uh, popular petition site, which 10 million people have visited and used to write and sign petitions. And uh, we're, I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about um, those experience there, th those experiences. And I'd be especially interested in hearing about the internal struggles you guys have had with people who are a little bit more skeptical about the potential of digital politics. One way to think about today's speakers is the significance of their role in defining technology, technology's impact on electoral politics and representative government. Um, the two might have more in common than their political persuasions suggest. Both have grassroots or community organizing experience. Both have a stated interest and are champions of making government more transparent. And both really want to find ways for people to participate in government. And both made TechCrunch's top list of top 10 uh, most impressive people in democracy in 2012. That list included President Obama, uh, Google's Eric Schmidt, and WikiLeaks' Julian Assange. And uh, to that, I will welcome now Matt Lira. Oh, sorry. Oh, your mic, Jeff. You don't need oh, cool. No, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, well, thanks, everybody. Um, it's very flattering uh, bio for myself. Macon's uh, deserves it and more. Uh, I wanted to talk today about uh, digital democracy. I kind of this is my entry slide, just because I thought it was funny with George Washington with the iPhone in his hand. <laughs> um, but it's a it's a really compelling issue, and I think the most important place that I like to begin is by saying that we've been through these kinds of transformations before, even if the transformation we're undergoing now is larger, arguably, than anyone since Gutenberg. Um, our constitutional system has faced uh, you know, substantial changes in the way we communicate consistently through our nation's history. Um, and each time, what makes that media platform unique um, has been what has, has served as the foundation to the challenge to our, to our system of government and, and has challenged our institutions to reform. So if you go all the way back, this is a famous photo of Matthew Brady with Abraham Lincoln, and this was done before he was president, uh, and it was right around the time of the emergence of still photography. And it's one of my favorite photos in our political history uh, because it's, it's carefully staged in a way that you probably wouldn't uh, notice offhand, but the collar is raised, uh, his hands are on books so that his, his, in the words of one photographer that I was reading uh, who analyzed this, it, he appears more proportional. And ultimately, he appears very statesmanlike. And this is the image that introduced Abraham Lincoln to most of the country uh, in the pre-presidential period. Uh, and so the mastery of that enabled, in some ways, his presidency. Uh, but also, you know, it created challenges like uh, well, over time as like, how do you leverage still photography uh, in the newspaper system into our government system? Then the emergence of radio came along, and the initial radio broadcasts, particularly those by government, were little more than sort of reading dryly newspaper reports into a microphone. And eventually what President Roosevelt realized was that rather than using radio as a medium for you know, bombastic declarations or uh, using it dryly for newspaper, he could use it to establish an intimacy with the American public through his fireside chats. Here, I just want to make sure. Um, through his fireside chats. And uh, as a way, you know, he was able to govern through several crises uh, and establish radio as foundational to our democratic systems of government. Now last, of course, you know, probably the home team favorite here, uh, but President Kennedy <laughs> leveraged television not only in his campaign, but then in government. Uh, you know, this is a, a photo from one of his famous press conferences that he had, leveraging direct addresses to the public from the Oval Office in a new way. And uh, it, wasn't that there, it wasn't that later presidents didn't do these things as well, but that he was able to realize that changes in the way that they, society communicated enabled government to interact with the public in a different way. And so each time uh, these transformations uh, challenged the way that our government works, and each time it was what made the new media unique that was the basis for how government reformed. And so the uh, establishment of radio, obviously the way people sounded, uh, became really important, and sound was fully integrated into our government. Television, the way things looked, and this sort of stagecraft politics became uh, inc incredibly important. And so as you change how people get elected, uh, you change who gets elected, which ultimately changes the way government itself functions. And I think that's one of the uh, 
baseline truth that's kind of what that is facing how our society is impacted by digital uh, age, and it's still very much in the beginning. Um, so how do these changes impact institutions? This is a photo that I like to show, um, but I've, it's actually the first time I've ever actually shown it visually. I usually just describe it, but I, I thought this time I'd actually show it. But this is a Senate hearing in the mid-1950s. And as you can see, this room is essentially perfect for radio because it's got microphones everywhere, but in no other way does it resemble what we would now consider a top-tier Senate hearing. And as television became more important, uh, you know, are the way the Senate functioned changed, it modernized as an institution, and, you know, it fully adopted the stagecraft of modern, you know, the, what we now consider a modern hearing. And you can see, obviously, it's effectively a large television studio. It even has control booths along the sides and stage lighting on the ceiling. <laughs> um, but this, the changes were more than cosmetic. And this is where I think the real potential lies. Um, in my opinion, the emergence of television, because it valued stagecraft in some ways over substance, created a government system that was dominated by sort of 30-second soundbite decision-making. And over time, over decades, I believe that has helped fuel a lot of cynicism towards public service. And it has given rise to what I consider the mythology that substantive decision making and substantive dialogue is in somehow bad politics. And there was nothing, I would counter by saying there was nothing non-substantive about the Federalist Papers or the Lincoln-Douglas debates or even the fireside chats. And that what Digital's great promise is that it can be a return to, in many ways, a substantive political culture and a substantive uh, government as a result. Um, and I believe that we're already seeing early signs that that's underway. And so what makes digital governance unique, or what makes digital media unique in the context of its predecessors? Um, obviously, it remains to be somewhat seen, but I believe that the fundamental aspect is engagement. It's the first media that you can talk back to in real time and that you can organize communities around in real time. And so the skills that are promoted by each form of media, um, each, form of, each era of media draws up certain skills to leadership in our society. And you know, radio, in many ways, if you study the period, as many of you have, uh, you know, elevated people who are really effective at leveraging radio and sounding a certain way. And there are certain people that wouldn't have been president, except they're really good at using radio. And television elevated stagecraft and the ability not only to present yourself well, but also to fund the 30-second campaigns that are necessary, uh, because you have to pay to run advertising in every media market. Well, digital governance, which we're still in the infancy of, if it truly is about engagement, I believe is going to elevate a new generation of leaders that are really good at engagement. And ultimately, um, that's going to be very beneficial for democracy. And I, have, I could go on for hours, but I'll defer to make it. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion and, uh, and to the questions and, and the rest. So. OK. So I'm going to start by telling you about a guy named Sir Nigel. Sir Nigel I met in Harare, Zimbabwe. Uh, as part of my current job at the State Department. And I was out in Zimbabwe uh, on a two-week trip to Africa, where I'd never been before, to promote an initiative called the Young African Leaders Initiative. And this is basically an effort to connect young African leaders with resources in the United States to help them develop as leaders, but also to connect them with themselves. Pretty straightforward. Um, and Zimbabwe was a place that we are prioritizing because there's a really exceptional young cohort of young leaders there. Um, Mugabe's done, made a lot of mistakes. One thing he has done is actually invested in the education system there. And it's an English-speaking country, so it's really poised to, to rock it forward. Um, and so I had a number of events, and the embassy there asked this guy, Sir Nigel, to promote one of the panels, sort of like this. Sir Nigel has a hashtag, pound263chat. And every week or two, probably every two weeks, he has a discussion about issues in Zimbabwe. You know, he'll talk about transparency and accountability in Zimbabwe. It's kind of like tilting at windmills at a certain point, but he's reaching out and trying to engage people virtually um, around these issues. 
And so the embassy said, well, what if you tweet out to everyone on this hashtag and try to generate a lot of enthusiasm for this event and get people to come? So we went. He's moderating. 300 people came to this event. It was crazy. We were sitting in a tent in Harare. The secret <laughs> police came. Um, everyone was there. It was a big party. And one of the points that the ambassador and I made uh, looking out of this group was, look around and introduce yourself to someone. And if you meet someone who shares your interests, who's also from Zimbabwe, the American government's made a huge value uh, here. We've been a catalyzing force to strengthen this network. So fast forward uh, a few months later, we are uh, now growing this initiative and doing all this online engagement with young African leaders. We have this big email list. We're trying to do Twitter chats with a sub-Saharan African youth cohort. It's the sort of new space we're getting into. And we, we try our first Twitter chat, sort of like Sir Nigel. We have a hashtag, Yali Chat. We email folks a week ahead of time. We say, we're going to talk about the future of Africa. Come join us. You don't know who we are, but let's chat. Afterwards, we assessed 8,000 unique accounts participated on this hashtag. That was cool. About 1,200 of them were created about 24 hours before the chat, meaning, or uh, 40, 72 hours before the chat, meaning that people got the email and were like, this Twitter thing sounds interesting. I shall join it so that I can participate in a chat with America. But people were joining this to engage with us. What was also interesting is we were able to look at that data store of 8,000 accounts, assess their network density, taking out the government accounts, but how, like, what were the sort of the, 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 the previous figure on terms of how many people were connected with one another and afterwards, and we saw an increase of 30%. Now, the guys that work for me are a lot smarter than I am. I'm not quite sure exactly what the formula is, but it's better than negative 30%. <laughs> What's interesting is we're actually able to quantify a policy goal in terms of increasing the network among young leaders in Africa. On Twitter, sure, that's a self-selected group, so forth and so on. But it's an interesting direction that we're able to go with this kind of engagement. So that was my experience in Africa. And I sort of find that as the story that I like to think about when I'm looking at public diplomacy generally. And we can get to that in a second. First, let me just give you a quick back, my quick background. Uh, I am 35. I consider myself incredibly lucky. I was young enough to use card catalogs in high school. When I was on, in college, email was like a thing, but professors couldn't assign pop quizzes. Like it wasn't a norm. You know, it wasn't like, I emailed you guys. Why didn't you know? We were just kind of playing around with email. Wi-Fi came on campus, and it was magic. I started uh, at Blue State. We were running around being like, I can't put a video online. It's just too difficult. What's a .avi? What is this? All? And then YouTube happened a year later. Facebook happened, and then since I went to Duke, I was like on one of the cool schools. I got to go in, like try it out. So like, I've seen a lot of this innovation happen, but my background is in a pre-digital age. And a lot of my time at work is spent trying to reconcile business goals for the organization to how technology can help us implement them. Explaining internally how these tools shouldn't get us away from our original goals, but can actually help us get there faster. I feel really, feel really quite lucky about that. So one of the tools that I want to talk about is We the People. We the People fundamentally is based on the idea that we want to address the issues that people care about. At the White House, we want to be a more responsive government. How do we do that? We the People is an attempt to do that. For those of you that don't know We the People, it's basically a system at whitehouse.gov. Anyone can create a petition. If it reaches a certain number of signatures, the White House will issue an on-the-record response. And we email that response directly to everyone who signed. That's part of the bargain. You get to tell us something, you verify your email address, you will receive one email from us responding. You can unsubscribe after that, but uh, we've had you know, 14, 16 million people use it. What's the number to get? Started, that's a great question. When we started, it was, uh, we, this was an internal debate. We were like, what should it be? We don't want it to be too high. Like 5,000 signatures. <laughs> that was way too low. <laughs> way too low. So then we moved up to 25, and we started seeing that uh, the number of signatures on average for a petition rocketed, but then once they reached 25, you know, the signatures fell off. So we realized, like, people are reaching that threshold. Oh, I'm sorry. 25,000. 25,000 in 30 days. People reaching that threshold 
and it was then maintaining between 25 and 30 for the rest of the month. We're like, wow, there's more potential there. Let's make it 100. Now it's 100,000, and it is still producing uh, petitions we need to respond to. Three of them I wanted to throw out in, uh, in particular, and I, I, I would imagine some of you have tracked this. First, you might say, great, you have this petition system. Does it actually matter? Does it affect policy? A lot of the times, no. I mean, a lot of the times, this is a, this is a new type of system. Uh, you will petition us. If you are in favor of online gambling, we will respond to you and say, here's why we don't support that. It's a way for us to explain ourselves, but it's not like we are going to revisit that policy based on this internet petition. Sometimes, though, it does. Two examples. One was SOPA PIPA. I'm sure a lot of you were tracking this a few years ago. Huge debate, but a very different dynamic online than it was in Washington, at least into a point. And that was sort of what drove the debate online. They were like, wow, these people in DC, they don't get it. They don't understand why it's so important. We had two petitions come across, and ha having to respond to it prompted a crystallization of our policy position that actually was issued in a response. That was the first time the administration went on the record about SOPA and PIPA uh, in opposition. And that had a material impact on uh, its future in DC. What is SOPA and PIPA? Uh, Stop Online Piracy Act and the Senate's version of that, whatever <laughs> it was. But essentially, it, was, it had a lot to do with intellectual property and um, some really technical aspects of the internet. Uh, you can Google it. Anyway, we thought it was a bad idea. You can see our response, and we'll explain it to you there. The second one we got was on uh, cell phone unlocking. This was like a really important consumer issue to a lot of people. Basically, the idea is after you pay your contract's value to your phone company, you still can't unlock it and use it on any other network. For some reason, the company's allowed to put a lifetime sort of lock on that phone so you can only use it on their networks. And there was a petition that said that's unfair. This was a great example of something that was not on our radar at all. It was something that was a product of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It happened. We weren't really paying attention to it. The petition came in. I'm the guy walking around being like, hey guys, like who owns this one? You know, like cell phone unlocking. And everybody kind of looked at each other and looked at the petition like, that makes a lot of sense. Like why? We support this petition. And so we issued a response saying, yeah, that's, this is wrong. Like, Congress should do something about that. And sure enough, Congress took up the legislation. Now, these, you could say, are exception to the rule. But they give me a lot of hope about what's possible with systems like this. Two other We the People stories I just want to tell very quickly. Um, the first uh, is uh, our response to the Death Star petition. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of our position, the Obama administration's position on Death Stars. Come on, don't be shy. All right, that's pretty good. Our position essentially is you would never invest that much money in a giant weapon system that could be destroyed by a single starfighter. Like, it just doesn't make sense. Clearly, it doesn't make sense. It is one of the most popular pieces of content the White House has ever released. Someone <laughs> petitioned us to direct the DOD to invest in building a Death Star, like the one in Star Wars. And because of the very liberal moderation we have on this, basically, it's free speech. If it's a possible government action, it's game. That thing got a lot of signatures really fast. We had to issue a response. Our response was basically what I just said, our policy position on that matter. But then we pivoted into all the things that the United States was investing in, or is investing in. One of the things we linked to was this thing called Spot the Station. And this is a fabulous service that NASA offers, which basically you can register for, tell NASA where you live, and when the International Space Station is above you at night, you get a text message. And you walk outside with your kids, and you look up, and there's this giant blinking thing, and that's the space station. Now, I'm from Huntsville, Alabama. That's where Space Camp is, so this one's a little bit near and dear to me. But getting kids excited about space is awesome. Also, just letting Americans know that we have a space station. A lot of them don't even know. That petition response drove 10,000 signups to spot the station. Some guy in NASA walked into his office one day and like, checked his report and was like, the system's broken, right? Something just went wrong. So it allows us to get people excited about space stations. The final thing has to do with a much more serious topic. So after the tragedy in Sandy Hook, big national debate on gun safety. And what became clear through a lot of the petition responses was there are many different sides to this debate. 
many different petitions across the threshold. We were able to sort of talk about the president's position on gun safety, factor in a lot of this stuff to the internal conversations. One petition in particular had to do with deporting Piers Morgan. Has anyone heard of this one? Yes. yes? Okay. Raise your hand if you've heard of Alex Jones. No? Okay. Interesting, different group than the Death Star. Um, the Alex Jones of the Kennedy School? No. No. Oh, no. <laughs> I withdraw my razor. Okay, okay, okay. I would say Alex Jones, I, like, the shorthand on that is he's like Rush Limbaugh's Rush Limbaugh. Or he's, I don't think it's that linear, but he's, he's out there in terms of his views. Totally fair. He can be out there saying whatever he wants to. He chose to say, because Pierce Morgan criticized the Second Amendment, we should revoke his visa, send him back to packing the United Kingdom. And he used his radio show to get a ton of signatures. Piers Morgan, ever the showman, invites Alex Jones onto his CNN show for two segments. And it is a, when we talk about like the debate around politics as a turnoff to the general public, it is a textbook example. Like, I, I mean, I challenge you to get through both segments. It's really hard. Just a lot of yelling. So anyway, we respond to that petition. And basically our response is, no, we're not going to deport someone for just saying what they think. It's not really how we roll. Um, but you clearly care a lot about this debate that's happening. We want you to know where the president stands on this. He believes in the Second Amendment. Basically, he doesn't want to take away your guns. Here's a video message from the president and so forth. At the end of all of these petitions, which as a reminder are emailed to everyone, so we get to go straight to them, we, we uh, ask a survey. We ask people to tell us what they thought of this experience. And my background is that people are much more motivated by negative experiences than they are by positive. Like they just love to hate on you rather than to praise you. So of the respondents, uh, something like 85% said that they would create or sign another petition, which to us was a basic test of like, how they perceive its utility. Is it worth their time to do it again? 30% told us they learned something new. Now what's interesting to me is 30,000 people, can you extrapolate to the 100,000, learned something new about the president's uh, policy on gun control, gun safety. How would we reach them otherwise? You know? And I don't think necessarily we the people is the only system we should try. Maybe it's not even the most efficient. But crossing those, those groups was something that was, I think, a genuine uh, piece of progress for us. So that takes me to the, the three challenges in terms of technology and government, and at least what I've seen over the last five years that I could use some help on, some critical thinking on. The first is, to the point I just made, there's a wide gap between protest and problem solving. And you're seeing this manifest itself in a lot of the criticism of online activism, clicktivism. What does it all mean? It's all stupid, right? Protest, tear down institutions, and then without the institutions, there's just this unstructured chaos. Well, that's, that may be true in some cases, and it's problematic. It's easier to be against something, to organize people and protest something, than it is to collaborate on something that solves a problem. Participatory budgeting is a really good example of that. And I think we just have to be aware of that. I think we have to figure out how we can make the argument, if we truly believe this is a positive direction, that yes, we're going to see the first wave of this kind of impact be around protest, but we're following it up with problem solving. And it's not there yet, but we have to keep that faith. And I have that faith, but I don't think enough people working on the issue every day realize that lack of faith in the general public. Um, the second one is probably not new. It's sorting and clustering and this whole thing I talked about with the gun control things. It's the filter bubble stuff that Pariser writes about. It's the 25 variables that se separate what you see in Google results from what I see. It's this notion that in a world where we really want to promote debate, we're actually building systems that are better at servicing content that people like us have chosen to interact with. Google, Facebook, otherwise. Um, I don't know how to solve this. Uh, it was in some of the papers that you threw out ahead of time, and, and I don't think any of them solved it either. Um, but it's a giant problem for us. And the first place is, who has the responsibility to solve it? Media companies have to make money. People are going to motivate on many different levels is it our institutions that should solve this? Like, I, don't, I don't even know who should be actually operationalizing 
the promotion of this debate. All I know is without some sort of force, the natural move is to cluster. Hugely concerning. And then the third piece, and then I'll, I'll sit down and shut up, but like the, the thing that I'm starting to grapple with a lot, particularly the State Department, but I think we also dealt with at the White House is understanding conversation on social media, accessing tools and data that allow us to do that efficiently while keeping privacy front of mind. What I mean by that is pre-internet, the way you kind of paid attention to the media was through clip service. You had people that would read the major newspapers. They would you know, bring it in, email it to you. Every morning you came in, you kind of saw a summary. And that was sort of the conventional wisdom. But there's probably been 30 different presentations of the last year that have explained in one way or another how that's not adequate anymore. Right? There's new conversations happening on social media in various platforms in new ways. People are more powerful. They're able to talk to government in new OK, well, government's not really able to listen uh, in a way that is efficient. And as someone who's constantly walking around the building saying, I know that you think these are the right topics, but it just seems to me that here's some other sort of categories of things we could address. I can't measure that easily. We're very conservative in how we approach social media monitoring, for example. But I feel like there's an expectation among people that when they complain about Comcast, Comcast swoops in and says, how can we solve your problem? You know, when they complain about uh, Coke or, or cheer on Coke, Coke may reach out to them individually and say, will you be in one of our commercials or something like that. <laughs> What's the balance government should strike there? We want democracies to be empathetic. We want them to listen. We have this great new data store, this great new place where conversation is happening. What are the rules of the road and how we can listen there? Um, and again, we're being very conservative there. But I want to be a little bit more aggressive, but I want to do it the right way. And I know there's a lot of great people here who think about privacy and technology. So anyway, thanks again for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here to talk to all of you. That's a little bit about what I do and what I'm thinking about. Look forward to your questions. Thanks. Well, I'll, I'll kick it off with a couple of questions for, um, oh, sorry. I'll kick it off with a couple of questions for um, both of you. The first one is your relationship to principles in your organization, the policymakers, the um, politicians. Um, and I guess the question is, why do they um, listen and give you space to employ, to advance your agenda with technology, given all of the risks that the input from a broader public that you might get through these platforms doesn't match what they want to do, you know, doesn't have their policy preferences, like the petition to pardon Edward Snowden, you know, hundreds of thousands of signatures, right? And you, everybody recognizes that risk, and yet you guys were able, um, you know, uh, both in the House and in uh, the White House to uh, convince politicians and policymakers to take this risk, which seems to me, if I were in that position, I would be reluctant to take that risk of actually getting more public input that you can't control, and in both of your cases, even getting that input in a, a pretty public way, right? It's not a suggestion box where only you read the answers, mm -hmm. right? So what are the arguments you had to make? Why do you think they did it? What are the limitations? Well, um, so there's a few. Uh, there's a few different levels to that. Obviously, I, I've, had, I've had one major boss, but now that I'm at the State Department, the Secretary, and, and um, Rick Stingle, who just started as the Undersecretary, uh, my, or my boss is there. A um, few different levels. First, no one really, I think at this point, thinks pe the general public are going to participate in rigged systems. Like, it's just, we're beyond the novelty of online engagement, where it's like, you know, Look at these sort of choices that we've curated and like oh. have a vibrant com like we need open systems. And this is a big challenge for us because you need open systems, but you also want to have them focused not necessarily on your political interests, but on the interest of the problem you're trying to solve. Right. 
uh, with We the People, we took a very wide uh, focus, and uh, you know, you can. It's interesting. We actually had to work with the Department of Justice to get an interpretation on the First Amendment, how it applied, and the rules we could use. And basically, you can't remove anything. Um, wow. So it's a pesky um, Constitution. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, the second thing is people um, have asked have asked me and asked a lot of my colleagues. You know, what's the secret of the Obama social media? strategy in the campaign 2008 and, and probably got the same questions in 12. My answer is always that this, the, the president, then candidate Obama, first job out of college was as a community organizer. And I think that's an important thing pe people forget, that he knows what it means to go and knock doors and work with people to make them more powerful in their own communities. And was able to see in the campaign that with technology, he could do that at a much larger scale. That was always part of the DNA of the organization um, about individual empowerment. And ultimately, political campaigns certainly have different incentives. They're about empowering their supporters. But as president, I would argue he's worked very hard to empower citizens of all spectrum. The final thing I'll say is, and this is more from the State Department, one of the strongest pieces that we have as a United States is Fundamentally, we're not afraid of anybody's opinion, and that we promote the open exchange of ideas. And maybe I'm a rube, and maybe I, I needed to learn this, but like I just didn't realize how lucky we, we were. And a lot of countries that we go to, even ones that aren't necessarily like legally binding in this way, like culturally, we just have such a better system and exchange of ideas than anywhere I've seen. And the more we can project that value, um, the stronger we are in our public diplomacy. Yeah, I mean, I think great comments. Um, when I I was re you you interested in you indicated in your introduction that I had other interests with baseball and some other things, and when I uh, after the 2006 elections, I effectively thought my career was going to be over <laughs> because if you, some of you may recall, Republicans got destroyed and we lost the majority. And as a young staffer in the House, uh, to go through the experience of losing the majority was actually instructive. And in retrospect, at least for the, you know, regardless of the national implications, um, you know, for, the, for those of us that were there, it was incredibly valuable to, to go through that experience, to be in the minority, and to regain the majority, uh, but having the knowledge of what it's like to lose power. And uh, let that, it changed my perspective from uh, one of sort of political gamesmanship to seek maximum advantage at all times to one of sort of an institutional perspective. You know, how can we ensure that the structure that is Congress and, you know, many reforms are, are still needed, but how can those structural reforms work so that the, it works for, of course, those that are in power, but also for the 50% of America, roughly, uh, you know, 49% of America that's in the minority party at any given time. And so those kinds of uh, structural reforms really became of interest. The, so I was ready to go home, is my point. And uh, the then Chief Deputy Minority Whip, uh, Mr. Cantor, sat me down. And really he had a, a, you know, he had a lot of enthusiasm for, uh, for digital and for what it meant for both you know, politically, how can we leverage it to, you know, rebuild a coalition, but also how can we leverage it to legislate better? And that enthusiasm drawn me. And so as in terms of access to principles, I think one of the differences between the legislative branch and the executive branch structurally, by nature of having 400 plus principles, <laughs> is that they're easier to get to. And so access to principles has always been uh, something that I've been be benefited from. And I think the broader lesson for change makers is um, you have to insist upon it at a certain level, um, particularly those going out to institute change. Um, the this, this, this structures of the status quo will sort of have these pathways that are built out. So you become, you know, press secretary, and then becomes a comms director, and then if you're really good, maybe you end up behind a podium in the West Wing, or you're the, you're the policy intern, and then you become the policy assistant, and you become the legislative director, and those kinds of when you are instituting change, you can go through those, you know, you kind of bounce around between all these traditional jobs, but really you're identified by your uh, 
by the work that you're doing that's the, the highest profile, which is usually the change inducing cha uh, work. And so the question becomes, uh, but the challenge really became for me is like, how do we continue to push change without capping sort of your ceiling in an organization? And, you know, I've been beneficial because I benefited from the fact that the principles I've engaged with by, cho by my choice have been the ones that most embrace that change themselves. And I think that's important for change makers. I think the president in, in, embraces it. I think uh, Mr. Kanner embraces it. And while they have different philosophical views on a spectrum of issues, <laughs> um, it's important when you're either making or myself or anyone else that's, is, is, does the ultimate boss of my organization believe in uh, what I'm, you know, trying to achieve in, with regards to this. And when I went to my current, you know, so I call it, I jokingly call it a sabbatical to the political committee, <laughs> to the Senate side, it's one of the reasons why, you know, I have direct access to the senators that I need to, to be able to impact the change I want within the, our political organization. Uh, because it's, it's an early lesson from my career, but I think it's something that has stayed with me, is you can only have you should have as, as equal amounts of authority that you have to the responsibility and accountability you ultimately judge by. So, um, and it's a difficult thing for change makers not to get boxed in by sort of a bureauc bureaucratic, you know, judo and, and be able to, um, to make that change happen. Um, in terms of your specific question, you know, how do you get con Congress, in, you know, in my case, to adopt reforms that would be on the face of it against their self-interest? I go completely with what Macon said that there needs to be a deeper philosophical recognition that, um, and this is somewhat what I was trying to get at with my opening remarks, is that you, to successfully adopt a new form of media, you have to appreciate what that media is about, what is distinct from its predecessors. And if, I, if you believe, as I do, that it is about engagement, then you, know, you have to do engagement well in a sincere, honest way to be able to integrate the media at all. And it's, th it's the reason why you know, Google beat Yahoo in the late 90s, you know, because Google said, I will give you authentic search results. And yeah, we'll have ads on the side and stuff, but, you know, these results will be authentic. I will build you a platform. And how you use that platform is up to you. And I think that the digital uh, integration into government, the best examples of that have the same. We the People certainly is one example from the White House, and there are others. But the ones that say, you know, here's, you know, the one, the, the Two points of failure that I most often see, at least right now. One is share your thoughts to the, you know, <laughs> inbox to nowhere. Thank you for your email address. I mean, one of the great things about We the People is there is true engagement if you read the threshold. But a lot of them are just like, thanks for your email address, and like, you know, don't, I don't even read what you said. Okay. And then the second thing, so having that true engagement follow-up, I think, is, is important. And then the second is um, not giving people the choices to disagree with you. And ultimately, the argument that I use with members of Congress is that if they disagree with you in enough, you're going to want to know that. You pay pollsters a lot of money to tell you that. And if the people are outraged about something, you can either find out now or you can find out on election day. The choice is yours. Wouldn't you rather find out before you pass a bill? And, uh, and that is uh, kind of how the, the argument that I most effectively used. One corollary to that, though, that I always get pushback from, particularly some of our nation's older leaders, I don't want to name check them, but it's a couple older governors, a couple older chairmen, all of whom are now retired from public office. They always push back and say, it's our job as representatives to use our judgment. Right. You know, it's, I'm right. I'm the policy maker. It's not my job to just say, what's the online poll? Yeah. And I think there's great truth to that. Ultimately, it is about them using their judgment and being accountable for their judgment to the public. <laughs> What the internet can do is make that judgment significantly more well-informed. Um, you know, I'm a huge believer in what you know, Clay Shirky talks about cognitive surplus and this idea that there is more knowledge, experience uh, in society than our society knows how to effectively utilize. And that the true gift of the internet, which is not yet achieved in any institution, government or not, is going to be figuring out how do you leverage all that knowledge and experience and ideas that are out there so that decision makers can make these incredibly well-informed decisions. Mm -hmm. And that to me is kind of the holy grail of mm -hmm. digital governance. Um, so a couple of years ago I used a couple of years ago I used to um, try to make this argument that um, politicians 
it, that uh, to technologists that it wasn't a technology problem, that it was a politics problem of the lack of engagement, right? That the technology part was relatively easy to solve if you could solve the politics part of it. Yeah. And so the, the example I used to give is, you know, you go to your own member of Congress or senator's website and try to connect with them th digitally, right? And they're all the same. You know, it's not even an email address. It's this form that you fill out with, you know, a couple lines of text at the bottom and then you don't know where it goes. And then you go, by contrast, you know, this kind of goes to the private sector point, right, to the website of Honda or Apple or whatever it is. And there are super rich discussions that are very critical about products and, and yeah. so on. And so... Has that changed a little bit? Like how many members of Congress, senators, um, administrators at the secretary, assistant secretary level are using more two-way tools that are, you know, beyond just yeah. the brush off, right? The so, digital brush off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, huh. How is the best way to answer this? I love my dad so much. <laughs> uh -oh. I love him. Um, he... IMs me from time to time, and we'll say in his IM, make and comma, carriage return. <laughs> I am heading to the store, and we'll be back in 15 minutes, period, carriage return, love, comma, carriage return, dad, send. Like, he's using IM, but he thinks like letters. And when I talk to a lot of interns, because one of the best parts about working in DC is like you get these amazing groups of interns that come through and cycle through. I always do the coward catalog thing with them. I'm like, how many of you know what that is? No one raised their hands. And I'm like, and then all the adults laugh. And then all the adults laugh. And I say, how many, uh, how many of you know what, we, um, what uh, uh, WhatsApp is? And they all raise their hands. And the adults are like, you know, what's going on? Um, the point is, like, in school now, from what I can tell, a lot of groups work collaboratively on Google Docs. You have, like, a group project. You spin up a Google Doc. Throw in a bunch of notes, start kind of collaborating. I've like written on this, and all of a sudden, like this different color cursor jumps up, and like something starts coming in. I'm, what is going on? I feel like an old man, you know? Like I don't feel like my dad at IMs. I think this notion of collaborative, of collaboration, is, uh, has exploded. Like the, uh, the ability to collaborate in real time to problem solve, and we're just seeing a new crop of people matriculating into government who intuit that. And a lot of the decision makers who set the culture sort of see that as an opportunity, but it's just not their habit. It's not a lot of asking for help. And part of that is the, uh, the, the sort of history, and you've got some folks who came of age at a different time. Part of that's the culture of DC, where asking for help is not necessarily a virtue. There are a lot of incentives to always have the right answer and not say, like, I need additional feedback, like, is this right? As opposed to academia, where if you're a monolith, if you are inaccessible and always think you have the right idea, you won't succeed. So consider this an admonition. That, like, you, you know, understand it's a very different space in terms of collaboration, but also understand that those spaces, I think, are starting to converge. Um, and we're certainly, I, I could go through a number of folks, but I, I am seeing a lot of assistant secretaries start to use Twitter in a much more consultative uh, aspect. A lot of ambassadors are using it. A lot of ambassadors, one ambassador, our ambassador Poland, in a room full of other ambassadors, I came in and sort of talked about social media, why you should use it, blah, blah, blah. He's like, listen, guys, here's like why it's valuable to me as an ambassador. I use Twitter, and I have a policy where I answer every question which I said, was, I don't necessarily endorse that, but good luck to you. <laughs> and it helps me in a few ways. First, I never get a question during a traditional TV interview I haven't already answered on my own terms in Twitter. Two, I'm much, more better, I'm much better at language because I know all the idioms of Polish because I'm tweeting with all these people all the time. <laughs> Third, I have to reduce these incredible policy positions we have into 140 character and it makes me better at understanding the underlying essence of our policy. And all these other ambassadors are like, hmm. You know, and so they're starting to get it. It's just encouraging that is sort of what I try to think about every day. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and it's it's uh, it's naturally progressive over time. Uh, I think it's a, it was a win five years ago just to have a presence and to use it to communicate your pre-existing messages. Um, and then maybe you add on top of that an engagement layer. And then on top of that, you, you potentially have a transparent engagement letter where you can see the good and the bad. Um, and you, you, you see this transformation happen at all levels of government, both locally and up to the President of the United States. Um. So uh, one thing I worry about is to, to stylize it, the difference between the Obama 2008 campaign and the 2012 campaign. So <laughs> I think all, all three of us in, in different ways interact with technology and, and our formative moments with technology or at a moment where it was about individual empowerment in different ways and, and liberation, you know, freedom. And, um, but then you kind of think about the big data and the victory lab and, you know, this is not a partisan thing. It's both Republican campaigning and Democratic campaigning where the use of the technology seems to be, uh, at least some of it, less about the two-way engagement and feedback and more about trying to target messages and figure out who wants to hear what and get that message to them in the maximally efficient way. And if that's the future, then I'm, I'm worried well, about yeah, that. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. And I, but I do believe, so there's a future where digital, gov digital governance, but specifically digital campaigning, is precisely that, which is this exploitative model of you know, overuse of segmentation, uh, you know, the digital brush off, which I love that phrase. <laughs> Uh, and it, you know, very exploitative. But there's an other future, which I believe works ultimately better, which is true, genuine engagement. And one of the things I liked about the Obama 08 campaign, specifically uh, uh, to that issue, was that much of the engagement was intensely real, I mean, particularly in the primary, uh, but even in the general. I mean, you had this notion of the house parties and the, you know, the neighborhood groups and empowering local precinct leaders to be responsible for 50 people, which is something that they carried over to, to 2012. And all, a lot of the work that Macon and Jeremy Bird and so many other people did, but it w when it was working, and it wasn't always intensely real. <laughs> I mean, don't give too much credit. But, <laughs> but, 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 but there was certainly its fair share of just traditional campaigning tactics. But when it was at its best, it was really intensely real. And I think that you know the, the congressional campaigns, when the ones that have been at their best also mimic that real, but doing it for real is really hard because that means you need to be able to have genuine discussions at scale with, for president, millions of people. And how do you facilitate that and have it be authentic uh, is an incredibly uh, difficult challenge. Yeah, I, um, I think you, you touch on a really interesting question and I, um, I think it, um, illustrates that there's just different incentives in politics and government. I mean, the way we, we have right now is you run for office to win. And so if there's a strategy that helps you win, then that's going to win out. And the strategy of being overly deliberative and sort of, you know, asking for consensus on what you should believe in obviously isn't going to work. On the other hand, being uh, sort of ideological to the extent that you clearly aren't in touch with other people, hopefully it's not going to work, although sometimes it has. Um, one of my favorite memories from 2008 that I, I feel like people don't bring up a lot, um, and maybe that's because it wasn't that interesting, but I, I was fascinated by it. Um, the uh, then Senator Obama took a vote on FISA. It's very you know, relevant to a lot of the debate that we are, are seeing right now. And a lot of the campaign supporters disagreed with this position. And we had the system called MIBO, where you could create a group of supporters. And, um, and it was open. It was an open system. Anyone could create these, these groups. And a lot of people, a lot of people did. Um, and this really smart guy, uh, and a, a group really said, you know what we should do is we should create a MIBO group, kind of like a petition, and just get everyone to join it, and the group will be called, We Oppose Your Position on FISA. And it did, and it worked. The media picked it up, and it became a big story of supporter revolt on uh, 
you know, President Obama's own website, his own tools. You can imagine just this was like catnip to the media. And inside the building, it was, you know, kind of a new kind of problem. It was like, okay, well, we create this open system. It's being really effective at getting our supporters to help us, you know, move the campaign down the road. Now it's being used, to your point, against us, or at least in a way that isn't in line with what we'd like to be doing today, to say the least. <laughs> and uh, ultimately, we made a choice to have uh, then foreign policy um, sort of expert and lead and counselor to the president, uh, Dennis McDonough, who is now the chief of staff uh, to the president, and Danielle Gray, who just uh, left the administration, was cabinet secretary before then, Duke alum, and uh, <laughs> Ben Rhodes, who's now the deputy national security advisor, get in the blog comment thread of that group and say, you know what? Ask us your questions about this issue. We may not agree on this. Uh, you may not agree with the president's position, but we want to make sure you understand why he's taking it. Okay. And a lot of the sort of misunderstandings about his policy and otherwise. And what was fascinating is I don't think any of those folks were like, you know, we were wrong the whole time. I'm going back to 100% for you guys. But it just took a lot of the angst out of the issue because people just wanted to be heard and treated seriously. And that to me was a moment where I said, this is an operation, this is a candidate, this is a leadership that wants to treat people seriously. And um, that's driven everything we've done since then. But that was a really fascinating experience. Uh, and one that obviously is a precursor to things like We the People, um, as well as an indication of just how sensitive and, and um, uh, vital public engagement is around issues like FISA and, and that sort of genre. Well, and, and how do you, uh, you know, because there's a, I'm deciding whether I should say something, I'll say it. <laughs> there's, a, there's a counter moment, and arguably from the 2008 McCain campaign, where, he, you know, he's famous for the straight talk and for taking any question and for fearing nothing. And he gets a one bad question on the plane, the campaign plane, from a reporter that makes a bad story, and he stops doing the straight talk moments. And I think it's the you know and, and that's you know a very similar crisis, and the reaction is different. And obviously, history shows one or the other. And I think that that speaks to our genuine shared belief that people who engage well will ultimately be victorious, and they'll apply that skill set to governance. Yeah. For me, the question becomes: it's a little less of an executive challenge. As, than it is a legislative challenge, but to some degree it reflects the executive branch as well, is how do you construct these systems? You know, we are, we are tinkering on the edges of a, gr of a great system in many ways, as you know, compared at least to all the others. Yeah. <laughs> and so as we undertake these reforms, how do we ensure that we're advancing it to the positive? Because there's two kind of, there's the urgency of achieving one's own agenda, right? And I need to pass this specific bill or this amendment um, or drive this message for a political gain. And then there's the wisdom of building a system that's strong enough to survive as long as the digital era survives, which potentially is going to be decades, if not the rest of the century, who knows, and has structures in place so that it corrects for the times when people of ill will are using these platforms and in positions to control them. Because right now, for example, and this is not a jab, but it's just a question, is, and this applies to Congress as well. So you have direct communication via email. On the one side of the coin, that's amazing. Because the- To your constituents. To your you constituents. Lists, yeah, 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 you have yeah. these lists and you can bypass the media yeah. and you can go straight to the person and you can talk, if in the right hands, you can be really substantive and you can answer their questions, and you can engage with them on issues as important as FISA or as kind of whimsical as the Death Star, in the wrong hands, you can tell them whatever you want because there is no accountability to anybody because you don't have to go through the media. Well, I, yeah, that's just and, true. And no one, I'm not suggesting that's happening now, but I'm suggesting that in the future that could happen, and these systemic reforms need to account for that possibility. Yeah, well, so, so a few things. I think that's uh, it's a really good point. One thing that's very clear, having worked for, uh, you know, uh, the campaign 
is that there is a whole sub network of email and information dissemination that perpetuates incredible lies and uh, crazy talk. Well, that goes both ways. And I mean, it certainly goes both ways. That's now, about I think the, the institutional yeah. actors and the government. I, I think have they they couldn't get away with that kind of thing, but it's certainly worth understanding that that kind of fear mongering has been happening for a while and it, it manifested itself very prominently in, a, in recent elections but um, it's not a it's not a what if yeah, you know well no no but uh, you're, you're right though it's constantly been faced but this is and it cuts both I mean as a proponent in many ways of the Ryan budget it's certainly not a thing that I'm unfamiliar with um, sort of how things can be demonized unfairly yeah. but the question becomes when you're tinkering with whether it's the legislative agenda of a congressional office or with how the executive branch makes decisions, how do you correct for that? Or how do you check against it, I guess? How do you apply the, the checks and balances against a system of direct communication? One answer is probably transparency because there's, you know, if you're totally transparent and people can engage on FISA or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, you could create a group that's like, this list is rigged group or whatever, and everyone can see that. But Without, that might not be enough. That might not be enough, candidly. Like, so it's, I think it's one of the particularly big challenges as we move to this digital governance, specifically from digital media for like, because between two ferns, when the president's not on there, doesn't have that problem, right? It's like, <laughs> they can, it's entertainment. So like, they're not going, I mean, they're going to be funny or not. And it's only digital governance which is going to face this particular challenge about how to check against its abuses. And candidly, I don't know the answer, but it's something that I think about a great deal. Last question for me before we open it up. Is, do you guys feel like there's a any sort of difference in uh, Republican versus Democratic styles of using digital technologies for engagement and communication, or uh, yeah, much same same page? I'm going to let Matt answer this one. <laughs> you know, I, honestly, because I, I think it's it's uh, not for me to sit here and, and talk about any specific political party. Um, that's what happens when you win. You get oh, to say yeah. that. That's <laughs> <laughs> also what happens when you read your legal briefing. <laughs> um, I'll make a, just a, a quick uh, related point. Um, I was just speaking with uh, Nico Mele, and uh, is he still here? And his Might have had to go. His boss at Shorenstein, a woman, uh, Nancy Palmer. Nancy Palmer, who I just met, and we were talking a little bit about what it's like in government and innovation and. The thing that's really exciting about particularly presidential campaigns, um, I just came here from uh, Digitas. It's like a digital agency in Boston and everywhere, and they've worked with a bunch of different big clients. And they were talking about a lot of things that they're doing, because I'm just trying to learn about where the private sector is on this. And profit is their organizing metric. <laughs> I mean, you know? Not Digitas is sure, but their clients, you know? So they're able to justify a lot of risk taking because ultimately they're moving product. That is a, that is a brilliant thing. It drives a lot of innovation. Um, but they deal with institutional resistance, particularly with the more profitable a company gets, the bigger it gets, the more bureaucratic it is, and we all know that story. Okay, so profit instead of measurable um, things, bureaucratic tendencies. Okay, government is very challenging because it's actually hard at times to find those metrics and that's been debated we can talk about that for a while but like you're not it's not profit based it's valuable but that value is sometimes harder to measure on a quantifiable or rapid pace although we're working on you know we're constantly looking at that so hard to measure i don't know if any of you have heard government's also kind of bureaucratic <laughs> so you got both the bads there Campaigns, particularly presidential campaigns, infinitely measurable because it's fundraising, voter contact, reduced to data about voters. You can really roll up a strategy all the way to the victory line these days. And every two years, they build up with these incredible volunteers that have these weird incentives where they leave their jobs at Google and wherever and go work somewhere. Build it up, poof, goes away. And that's a little bit of a heartbreak because you build this thing up. and you're like, But then four years later, you build it back up. So no bureaucracy, totally measurable incentives, 
that's why we're seeing so much innovation come <laughs> from this space. I mean, it's just really, if, if you ever have the chance to jump on a presidential campaign, there's nothing like it. And I, I've only worked on one, so I can't comment on the other parties, but I would assume that generally it is going to be a much more innovative space as we move forward. Anyway, that's all I'll say about it. But Yeah, and one quick thing on that before I get into the partisan thing. Uh, <laughs> It's funny, like the Friday night before Ryan was selected as the VP nominee, I was out at a local establishment a bar in, in DC and I was talking with people about the election and this was August of 2012 and I was like, you know, I hope we win but there's no way I'm going to this campaign. And like, you know, I've, I've, it's a, it takes your life over and I'm happy on the Hill and I love working in these structural issues and I, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Next morning, Paul Ryan is selected as VP nominee, which I was, was news to me. Sunday, you know, I get a phone call. It's like, hey, I need your help up here. Come on. Tuesday, I live in Boston. <laughs> so Friday night, never going to the campaign. Tuesday, I live in this great city. So it was very like, that's the nature, I think, of campaigns at the presidential level in particular, and it's a great thing. Um, but getting to the question about the different approaches, I think, one, I think the Obama administration, the Obama campaign, obviously the campaigns, let's we'll start with the campaigns. Obama campaign has, is a pinnacle example of what's possible, and, and is, but it, I still think is just a preview of what's to come in terms of how digital impacts politics, especially at that level. Um, I, think there are, it, I think that overshadows a lot of Democrats who don't do it as well, candidly, uh, because they've been around, you know, or whatever, and they're not in tough races. And so it's not like every Senate office is a mini Obama campaign, you know, et cetera. On the Republican side, um, there's the there's a legitimate hunger to, to do well, and so I think that fuels uh, a lot of, of of investment and effort, and that only gets magnified um, after defeat. And so one would argue that the 04 campaign was more sophisticated than uh, the Kerry campaign, and that it kind of is a cyclical thing about innovation is like a baton that gets passed between the two parties based on who loses. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what happens. In terms of how it applies to governments, I can't really see, other than the philosophical differences about what they're trying to do with it, I, don't, I haven't seen a lot of difference over how the, it's approached. And I, it's not only interesting, I think it's vital. It's hard enough to change government just because it's government. <laughs> and the worst, this is what I, you know, I work more closely, I mean, we worked on occasion, but more closely with people, um, you know, day to day when I was in the House, obviously with Pelosi's office and Hoyer's office, people like that. And, you know, and they're interested in, in, in structural change as well. And it's like we, uh, you know, are fighting the same fight against the same forces. Why would we be stupid enough to let the fact that we disagree about 89% of other things to divide us on this one <laughs> big goal, right? <laughs> and so there's a legitimate consensus to work together. And and um, I think to the degree uh, that there can be sort of an intellectual consensus about the overall objectives that, that will be really beneficial to this reform, you know, and that's a tradition in this country that goes back to, you know, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and, 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 and Alexander Hamilton. And I'm certainly not comparing ourselves to that time because we're, we're just but a shadow. But the fact is that they had disagreements about policy to the core. Uh, but they could find agreement and compromise about structural reforms to make the system work to enable their debates about policy to be better. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is what the digital space should be about. That's a well great said. note to open it up there. So uh, questions, thoughts, from comments? from Yeah, go ahead. It sounds to me like you guys are um, beating around the bush on structural reform. You're talking about relatively minor things, changes to the media and stuff. Imagine you were God and you could rewrite the Constitution and, you know, change the state boundaries, you know, all, all manner of stuff. What would be beneficial? What would you do? I defer. A couple more questions. <laughs> oh. I mean, to some extent, it's interesting. But I haven't really worked on this. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm sorry. No, I'm just serious. I'm not making a joke. Um, at the State Department, but in fact, some of these questions are actually happening with countries that we deal with. They're going through constitutional yeah, reform. Uh, and so there's a um, there's a guy I work with named Tamika Tillman, 
um, who is uh, looking at civ civil society portfolio, uh, and in, he's actually engaged precisely in this uh, consultative process. So to the uh, point I was making earlier about decision makers using these tools to engage the public. And, um, you know, he hearing your question, it's sort of humbling because I don't think about that so much. I mean, I wouldn't want to sit here and speculate on how I'd rewrite the Constitution because maybe because I've worked in government for five years, I've come to accept it as a constraint in my life that gives me purpose and something to push against, you know, like a jungle gym. You know, a, a piece of uh, 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 land isn't that fun. You put like a bunch of bars on it, you have a lot of creative fun in that framework, um, even when you're 35. Um, and so I, I, don't, I don't think about it that much. However, I had a great conversation with someone from Google once who was talking about Google civil society, Google.org stuff. And uh, this was the most interesting comment I think I've heard in a while. They were like, yeah, you know, Google's really interested in, you know, how you would model government, what it looks like, and they want to get more involved in the space. I was like, great, they should come to Congress and we should, like, have a really big thing. Like, no, no, if we colonize Mars, like, how do we actually run that society? <laughs> and I was like, oh, whoa, like, I'm in the, I got to get out of D.C., man. Like, wow. So uh, suffice to say, I, like, I want to think about that more, but um, maybe I'm a pragmatist where, to me, the real... There are so many issues right now that matter to people on a week-to-week, -week, month to month basis that I'm focused on implementing policy within a very durable framework, and I haven't really speculated on it. But I'll, I'll think about it. <laughs> well, uh, I think that, like I, <laughs> like, I adore the Constitution. I you know, swore an oath to it for them when I worked in government because you have to, but <laughs> but also because I I believe it. I think that the system that it was set up is is it's amazing how good it is at protecting against the abuse of incompetence or corruption or ill will over time. Um, it's not perfect, but it enables itself to be. It has a mechanism to improve itself, um, and it has a mechanism to you know when you've got you know, a criminal in office or someone that doesn't care about, you know, they can't just run roughshod over everything and become dictator or whatever. Like, you know, the challenge, the price you pay for that is that when you have people of, of goodwill, um, it, the system is difficult. I think the piece that's missing in the equation is how do you sustain, and this is kind of how I would apply your question anyway, is how do you build uh, constituencies that... Um, are driven by kind of the, one of the great challenges right now is you a bill will be named something and if it's like so it's like let's say the you know the red vest improve or the red fleece improvement act <laughs> as a red and let's say that the text of the bill is in many ways not actually good for and this is not a big thing i'm just saying this in general like our political culture the ad television political culture because it's the 32nd political culture, all they're going to know is the name of it and whether you are for it or against it. And that is, in many ways, uh, that creates cynicism over time. It just does. And what was great about our democracy and what I think digital re-enables is those really substantive discussions, some of which will never generate headlines and may never change votes, but they're just operational. And uh, you know, small incremental improvements that add up quickly, which create trust that can then be used to do big things. Instead of needing always to succeed, needing always to do big things, or you're at risk of losing your coalition. All right, I want to answer. Your, I want to not answer your question one more time because <laughs> I've thought about it before. Okay, so this is still not going to be satisfying, but it, consider it based on my experience, and and uh, I've certainly had a unique perspective the last few years. I think a really fabulous sort of uh, uh, thought exercise wouldn't be how would you redo the Constitution, but sort of accept like the Constitution is what it is in the United States. How would you reimagine a congressional office or the, the structure of the White House or its day-to-day -day operations in a digital world, yeah. considering its fundamental incentives, considering like what you know you would we would all accept are the basic things uh, you know we would want a president to be interested in. 
What are, ta what are daily press briefings all about? You know, should we revisit that idea? What uh, is the sort of difference between press and communications, public engagement, uh, political affairs, legislative affairs, pol to look at all these things that in fact a new president could say, I want it different. I want this capacity to be the first thing I see every morning when I come in. I want that one to really be reined in. Having been at the White House for a while, and I think you probably say the same thing about congressional offices, it's really quite remarkable how little they've changed. Yeah. Um, given how much things have changed. Like I would love to see a C-suite at a Fortune 500 company now versus 20 years ago and sort of observe the physical layout, the power mm. structures, the behaviors, information sharing, and then try to extrapolate that delta onto the C-suite of government. And to me, like that accepts the durability and sort of fundamental idea of the Constitution, which I still accept, but also it gets at, I think, the need for more organizational change and business process change uh, in government. That's absolutely right. That's, that's a really interesting way to think about it. One more question? do better in transitioning from the campaign to actually the government because you created like a lot of momentum in 2012 and how did you use that when you came to the government and what do you think could have been done better? Um, hmm. What could I, what was a big challenge, what, could, what was a mistake I made? So I think yeah, there were a few, there were a bunch of screw ups and we, we can talk about them later, but maybe over drinks, like we go out <laughs> and like, need to kind of like get ready to talk about those. <laughs> I, I think a strategic decision, two strategic decisions I would have made differently. First is the day after the campaign, I woke up at 8 a.m., I came back into the campaign office, it smelled like a you know party after, you know, the day after, <laughs> launched this website, went home, packed, got on the plane bought three suits of Joseph Bank and went to this like government <laughs> building and was like, all right, it's a transition. <laughs> and I proceeded to plan my entire department and kind of design what I thought the new media operation for the White House should look like in a pretty much a vacuum. I mean, I reached out to people, people reached out to me, there were a lot of things, but no one really knew what we were gonna do. And I overplanned it. So you can roll that back to a few things. First off, I think I hired my entire team before I went in, uh, or almost my entire team. And in retrospect, I think it would have been better to treat it like a startup, because I talk about it like a startup at times, and go in and, but I felt so much pressure to deliver from day one on a public expectation about what President Obama's use of technology would be. I think I overcompensated. And that might have been me not just having the strength to weather it. Um, I also like we designed it, built a website, populated it with information. There's parts of this website I think literally no one's ever seen, but we thought it would be really great um, when, when we were in this like building. You know, that, that's one sort of example. The second strategic issue I think that I couldn't get my head around at first was on the campaign in Chicago, the our communications channel and new media was very anti-elitist. It was very anti-DC. It was very like, there's a team over here that deals with a lot of the Beltway press and, and they deal with a lot of the political reporters and that, you know, if you're a political junkie, they're interested in you. We're interested in people who are, it's their first time in politics. They're kind of waking up and saying, there's a problem I want to solve and this seems like a guy who can work with me to solve it. Like, how do we give them the tools to make an impact? Uh, which was awesome. I think coming into Washington, I didn't appreciate the gap in between enough in the sense that I think it could have spent a lot of time, we ended up spending a lot more time as we went on, working to work from the beltway out rather than from the general public in. So you look at a, a, a place like Think Progress, I think they're a fabulous uh, blog. I mean, I just think Center for American Progress did a great job there. But they start with sort of policy wonk and work to make it a little bit more accessible rather than general public and trying to bring it in. And so as a result, I think we kind of 
went after these large swaths of the general public that we just fundamentally weren't reaching at times or they didn't care, when we could have actually had more of an impact supplementing um, the debate and messaging and engagement with more of the think tanks and the sort of coterie of people around the hill and whatever. But we corrected over time. Those were too strategic. I wish I could do it that differently. Big, uh, the, the it's a great, great note to end on. Yeah, yeah. Time. Well, I think the great note to end on is the is the eighty nine percent, eleven percent point. Right? right now in American politics, there's huge, huge, obviously policy disagreements um, that are that are deep and and will last for some time. But it, you know, it's important to remember that there is a lot we can work on and make progress on at the structural level to yeah. make democracy do things better. And thanks, Megan and Matt. For oh, thank you for having us. Thank you. Good job.